Welcome to the Be Here Now Network guest podcast. This series features talks from a myriad of modern spiritual teachers expanding on how we can all live a life in balance. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash guest. I'm live with my friend Daryl Davis, incredible blues musician, a wonderful teacher of love to our planet. Daryl, what were you just saying? I was talking about uh, perspectives and reality. And I was saying that one's perspective is one's reality. Whatever people perceive becomes their reality. You know, you, so, so for example, you take a kid, uh, he goes to a magic show and he sees the magician, you know, saw a lady in half and he sees her legs over there and, and her torso over here. And to him, the magician saw that lady in half. That was real, you know, or the, or the, the elephant disappeared off the stage, you know, whatever the case is. That, that is his perspective. That is his reality. This happened. And it's the same thing for us as adults. You know, we, we have perceptions about certain things, perceptions about black people, perceptions about gay people or Muslims or Jewish people or whatever. Those perceptions become one's reality. And we cannot change somebody's reality. All right, so here's what we have to do. We offer them different perspectives. And when they see a different perspective and they relate to it, they change their own reality. So that's how you get one's reality to change. Don't go after their reality. Give them other perspectives to consider. So so would that encompass all the work that you've done disrobing so many members of the KKK? It's not that you've gone to try to change their perspective. What have you done? You've shared your perspective. And their perspective has changed as a result. Exactly. Precisely. Precisely. Can you give me an example? Yeah, sure. Okay, because, I mean, if, if I were to go in and say, hey, look, you know, you're wrong. You know, I'm just as good as you are. My brain is just as, as, as the same size as yours is, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're wrong for hating me. You know, my, the color of my skin is not negative. I'm going after their reality, and that's not going to work. You know, so I listen to them. I offer them, the, the, you know, perspectives on, on how I view people. Uh, show them things that have happened to me, things that I have experienced. And I allow them all this, uh, you know, they already have preconceived notions about what a black man is supposed to be. He's inferior, he's a criminal, uh, he, he's lazy, doesn't want to work, you know, he's unintelligent, all that kind of stuff. So when I'm sitting down with one of these people and I ask, you know, how can you hate me? You don't even know me. I get things like, well, Mr. Davis, you know, black people are prone to crime. And this is evidenced by the fact that there are more black people in prison than white people. Okay, I, you know, I, don't, I don't argue with the guy because what he's saying is true. There are more blacks in prison than white people, but it is a half truth because he's not considering the fact that this country has, a, has an imbalance in their judicial system that puts black people in jail or puts them there for longer sentences than whites who have committed the same, you know, crimes or whatever. Or he doesn't consider the fact that there are plenty of poor people in prison, white and black, who uh, who cannot afford adequate legal representation. And they take a plea to something, you know, they didn't even do. And so now they languish away in prison. And then he says that uh, black people are inherently lazy. We don't want to work. We prefer to scam the uh, government welfare system, uh, always have our hand out for a freebie or whatever. And then he goes on to say that, uh, that uh, black people have a small, we're born with a smaller brain than white people. White people have a larger brain, so the more capacity for intelligence, the less capacity for intelligence with a smaller brain. And, uh, and he says this is evidenced by the fact that every year, black students consistently score lower than white kids on the SATs. Again, this is true. Black kids do score lower than white kids on the SATs every year. Now, I'm listening to this stuff, all right? I'm letting him get it all out. Um, Is what he is saying true about this? Yes, it is true. Black kids do score lower than white kids, but it's a half truth because he's not considering the other perspectives. He, He sees the results 
and that shapes his reality. The scores shape his reality. So, uh, you know, once he's done, I know that is, is what he's saying to me offensive? Absolutely, it's offensive. But am I offended by it? Absolutely not. And the reason being, why would I be offended by a lie? What he is saying is not true. So I shouldn't get myself all riled up over a lie. You know, he's telling me that I'm, I'm prone to crime because of my skin color. He's telling me that I'm lazy. He's telling me that I'm unintelligent, I'm dumb. Um, you know, if my mom or dad were to say that to me, I might, I might, you know, take some, some, some credibility with it. After all, they brought me into this world, right? And they raised me. But not some guy who walks into the room 10 minutes ago and sees me for the first time and sees my skin color and makes all these assertions. Why should I, why should I be offended? It's not true. So don't let your emotions get in front of you. You know, he's, he's not used to that. He's used to push back when he radiates all that vitriol to somebody like me. It, it, oftentimes there's verbal pushback within 30 seconds. You call somebody stupid or call them a criminal based on their skin color. They're going to push back and it'll start verbally and then it can escalate and become a physical confrontation. And then the whole conversation devolves because it's no longer productive once you, once you, you know, you have blows. So I just sit back and listen to all his vitriol. And so now, uh, cause see, if I, if I tried to, to, to counter him every second, his wall would stay up and he'd be like this because his reality does not allow him to hear what I'm saying. Right. All right. So he's, he's plugging his ears. I want to bring his wall down because that way his ears began opening. So I allow him to get all that vitriol out. And then once he has exhausted it, he feel, and I've listened to him, I told you, people want to be heard. They want to be respected. They want to be treated fairly. I'm treating him fairly. I'm letting him talk. I'm letting him be heard. I'm showing him the respect as a human being. Go ahead and you know, say what you got to say. All right? So now he feels compelled to reciprocate. I gave him what he needs. So now it's my turn to talk. I could go on the offensive. I could go on the attack. And I would well be within my right to do so. I could say, no, you are the criminal. You are the one hanging black men from trees. You're the one bombing black churches and dragging black men behind pickup trucks. And I would be 100% right because the Ku Klux Klan has a 155-year history of doing that, all right? So I, I would be right. But if I went on that attack, his ears would be plugged up. Because, you know, he doesn't want to, you know, you know uh, face that reality. And he knows it. So rather than go on the offense, I go on the defense. And I say, listen, I hear what you're saying. However, I don't have a criminal record. I'm black. I don't have a criminal record. My mom and dad don't have criminal records. Uh, I've never been on welfare. My parents have never been on welfare. As far as brain size goes, I've never measured my brain size, but I'm sure it's the same size as anybody else's. And as far as SAT scores go, my SAT scores got me into college. I have a bachelor degree. Both my mom and dad had master's degrees. And my dad, before he passed, was working on his PhD. Now, I'm saying all this stuff, which is true, knowing that this guy is sitting two feet in front of me, the Klan leader, you know, he barely made it out of high school. I know that I have more intelligence in my little fingernail than he and his whole clan put together. But I'm not going to throw that in his face because that would cause this to happen. So I just talk about myself. And I can tell you for sure, Chris, this happens every time. People go, I've been doing this for 37 years. He goes home, and, and because he heard what I was saying, because his wall was down, his defenses were down because I gave him that respect. I allowed him to be heard. I was treating him fairly. That's not what he's accustomed to. So he heard what I was saying. And he, and he thinks at home, you know, when he's reflecting on, on his day, man, I just had a three-hour conversation with a black man. You know, that's never happened before because usually, you know, we, you know, we're at blows. And, um, and, and what Daryl said about such and such, it makes sense. Oh, but he's black. But what he said was true, but he's black. So they're having a cognitive dissonance. You know, he realizes what I said was true, but he doesn't want to accept the fact that it came from a black source. Because after all, he is superior and I am inferior. That's what makes him a white supremacist, right? He considers me to be inferior. 
All right. But yet I, I, I showed him something that he didn't know and he found it out to be true. So how, how is it that this white guy didn't know the truth and this black guy does? This boggles his mind. So that's the different perspective he sees. He realizes that something was true. So he is left with a dilemma. His dilemma is, do I um, disregard Daryl's skin color and accept the truth because I know it's true and change my course and change in, uh, my ideology? Or do I consider the fact that he's black and go ahead and live a lie, continue living a lie? That becomes their dilemma. In most cases, they choose the truth. There will always be those who will go to their grave being hateful, violent, and racist and choosing the wrong thing. But if somebody is willing to, who, who's, who's hateful, violent, and racist, is willing to sit down and have a conversation, and you don't let your emotions get carried away, don't put them in front of you, keep them behind, you know who you are. You know, so you know, so you, you're not gonna let somebody else define you. Because if you, know, if you don't know who you are, you have no, I mean, have an open mind always, but know who you are. If you don't know who, who you are, you have no business going into a room with somebody like that because they will tell you who you are. And depending upon where your self-esteem is, you might walk out of that room believing them, <laughs> you know? Well, that's what I was thinking as I heard you share the story about the KKK member, you know, just in general, that they would be basically, uh, they're used to when they come at people, uh -huh. people fighting back. Right. Right. Exactly. So what I find amazing is that you're you're able to listen to people yelling racist slurs in your direction and saying all these lies, essentially, and to have it not affect you. And what I heard as I was hearing that is, wow, Daryl, Daryl must have some amazing parents, have amazing upbringing because you have a very high self esteem. I think a lot of people, regardless any skin color. Some people can't even, you know, be told that they're losing their hair. It would throw them off the deep end. So my question to you is where does that such positive image of yourself come from? Where do you think you develop such self-esteem? I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, my parents probably. My, you know, my parents always told me I could be anything I wanted to be. Just make sure that I'm honest about it and disciplined. You know, now, of course, you know, Every little kid, you probably too, you know, whom, you know, all little boys at some point in their life entertain the idea of being a policeman, a fireman, an astronaut, the president of the United States, or whatever their daddy was. You know, we all entertain those things at some age, right? right? And of course, you know, I was going to be president of the United States when I was a kid. Uh, now, my parents, you know, they knew full and well, <laughs> not in your lifetime, you're not going to be president, you know, but they weren't going to tell me that. Mm. You know, because, you know, they, they didn't want to destroy, you know, what I was envisioning and say, well, Daryl, you know, you probably will never become president because you're black, you know, and whoever thought, you know, none of us thought, you know, we'd see a black president, you know, especially in 2008, but we did, you know, so, you know, they instilled that in me, you can be whatever you want it to be, you know, you know, you, you're, you're no better and you're no worse than anybody else. And the fact that they took me all around the world and exposed me to different things all kinds of different cultures. I grew up with different cultures. When, when I was in class overseas, my first exposure to school, you know, I first started traveling when I was age three, because my dad was in the foreign service. And so my classes overseas were, you know, were full of kids from all over the world. Anybody who had an embassy there, all of their kids went to the same school. So my classmates were Nigerian, Czechoslovakian, you know, um, Russian, German, Italian, French, Australian. You know, it was like a United Nations of little kids. That was my class. That was my first exposure to school. But when I would come back home here to my own country, uh, I would either be in all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the uh, still segregated or the newly integrated. And there wasn't the amount of diversity that I had overseas. So I was already prepared for multiculturalism. That's how I grew up. You know, unfortunately, some of my peers were not. And so when I was overseas, I was living literally 10 years into the future because that, that multiculturalism you know, uh, scenario had yet to come here. That's how you grew up from age what? When did you start traveling? Three, age three. Three until? Uh, I came back here at the age of 13, 14. Wow. United yeah, so, so my formative years, I, I was seeing all kinds of different stuff and I was accepting it. It was, it was, the, it was my norm. 
it was normal. Yeah, it was my it was, norm. It was like growing up on a stoop in Brooklyn with all the different cultures in one place. You got it, exactly. But Everybody should see that. Everybody should see that, you know? And, uh, it, and what's funny is this. Um, you, know, you know, a long time ago, like, like, like your parents, you know, they grew up, uh, they remember black and white TV. You know, you probably don't, you know, but they they remember black and white TV and your grandparents certainly remember it because, you know, TV was just coming in. Um, but, and then eventually it went from black and white TV to uh, to color TV. It was like, wow, a whole new dimension. You know, right. now we take color TV for granted. I'm sure, you know, probably your grandkids will be watching 3D TV, right. you know, or something, another dimension, right? Um, so that's the progression. You know, you, 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 you try to improve stuff. You go from black and white to, to color TV. Well, I kind of like went from color TV to black and white. Because when I was overseas, my classes were technicolor, you know? And I come back home, it's black and white. Because we didn't have the diversity in this country that we do today. It was just black kids and white kids. Maybe an occasional Asian, an occasional Hispanic. But you know, today it's like you know everybody's here, um, but back then it's just black kids and white kids in the school. You went from an open perspective; your your perspective stayed open, and then you came to a scenario where people had a much more limited perspective. I, I, I went from a digital cell phone to a rotary dial. <laughs> you, you remember the rotary dials? Yes, I do. Yeah, my, okay. my uncle Mondu's house, yeah, in Brooklyn, he had one of those. Yeah, he even had a press like there was a letter in his rider right. or something. I was like, exactly. Why? I love what you said, though, about the, how to shift somebody's perspective. I think that's a psychological, I think that's a, I mean, it's a psychological, it, to me, it's the Daryl Daryl Davis School of Psychology, which everyone should attend. But it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you hear the new, you know, you hear, it's just so simple. Like, I'm even thinking in terms of, not only in terms of racism, but even in terms of, like, intimate relationships, in sure. terms of business relationships, uh, friendships, anything. It's like, cause I certainly get into that mindset of you, you hear somebody saying something that's like, it's clearly not true. And, and all you want to do is say like, like, what? don't you understand like that? That's not, but all that does is they just shut down immediately shut down because you're attacking their reality. You can't change someone's reality, but you, you can, can offer, offer different them a new perspective. Exactly. So, so if that new perspective is true, mm -hmm. then they're left with a few options. The first option is to hear the truth, ignore it, pretend they didn't hear it, but they did. So now mm -hmm. they've got to repress that as mm -hmm. being part of their reality, which then becomes this sort of like diluted, repressed reality, which isn't honest. Or they see the new reality and they accept it, right? Right, exactly. I'll give you another example. So this Klansman was riding in my car. He's, a, he's over here in the passenger seat. I'm driving and stuff. And we got on the topic of crime or whatever. And um, black on black crime, which there's really no such thing. Um, they, they, you know, what it is, 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 is crime of opportunity. You what know, do you they mean? Call, they call, well, you, you've heard the term black on black crime, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, it's a big term. It's, that's, that's a BS term, okay? Um, it's, it's crime of proximity, all right, because, you know. Opportunity, okay, yeah. Opportunity and proximity, okay? Like, okay, let's, let's say, you know, I mean, where, where, do black, where, you know, where do most black people live? In black neighborhoods, right. all right? So if somebody is having a drug, a drug uh, withdrawal, they need drugs, whatever, they're not going to go all the way across the city to some white neighborhood and rob somebody. You know, they're going to do it right there. You know, I need this thing now. You know, I see this lady, and I'm going to snatch her purse and get her money and go to my dealer and buy my drugs, you know, or whatever it is, you know, they got to do. Um, so, you know, in black areas, there's, there's a lot of black on black crime. You never hear the term white on white crime, but it exists. Who's, who's doing all the crime in Bangor, Maine? White people, because that's what lives in Bangor, Maine, you know? Or, or in New Hampshire, or, or at some ski resort, you know, whatever. Ski resort. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Aspen, Colorado. Aspen, Colorado, Vail, Breckenridge, Telluride, okay? You know, any crime there is, is going to be predominantly white, all right? So, but, but it's not referred to as white-on-white white crime. Right. Even though that's what it is. 
you know, it just makes black people sound negative, and that's and that's their their purpose for doing that. So it's it's crime of proximity. You know, if you're going to commit a crime, you you get it. You you don't want to have to travel to do it. You want to get it done. So anyway, we're talking about black on black crime, and he and he said, well, you know, you know, black people have a have a gene within them that you know that 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 make that you know that makes them uh, criminal, that makes them violent. And so I'm driving. He's sitting over here. I said, you know, what are you talking about, man? And um, he said, well, who's doing all the drive-bys and carjackings in Southeast? He was referring to Southeast Washington, D.C., which is a predominantly white area, I mean, a predominantly black area, and, uh, and it's high crime-ridden. There are some whites who live there, but it's predominantly black and very high crime-ridden. I said, okay. I said, it's black people. I said, but that's what lives there. I said, who was doing all, all, all the crime in Bangor, Maine? White people because that's what lives there. I said, you know, you're not even considering the demographics. He goes, oh, no, no, no. That has nothing to do with, that has nothing to do with it. You have this gene. And I said, listen, I'm as black as anybody you've ever seen. I said, I have never done a carjacking or a drive-by. How do you explain that? This guy, this Klansman sitting next to me, did not pause for one second. He answered me like that. He said, your gene is latent. It hasn't come out yet. Oh my God. All right. So I mean it almost came out right then. But, oh my God. It almost but, came out right then. <laughs> but uh <laughs> you know, and I was speechless. I was dumbfounded. How do you argue with something like that? He was so far out in left field, I couldn't even bite onto the tail of it and chew on it. You know what I mean? That your was, gene your gene is latent, good. hasn't come out yet. That's his reality. That's his reality. You can't even, I don't even have a comeback. There's no comeback. And there's no comeback. Okay. So I'm, I, I'm just like looking like a deer with, you know, with, you know, in the headlights. Uh, wow. I must have this gene, right? He's over here, like all smuggling. As you see, you got nothing to say. You know, he's all smug and secure because he knows he's right. His reality is his reality. So I thought about it for a second. And I said, well, you know, all white people have a gene in them. That makes them a serial killer. And he says, well, how do you figure that? And I said, name me three black serial killers. He thought about it. He couldn't name any. I said, here, I'm going to give you one. I named one for him. I said, here, I'm giving you one. Just name me two. He couldn't do it. I said, Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Henry Lee Lucas, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, David Berkowitz, son of Sam. I said, they're all white. You're a white man. You're a serial killer. He goes, Daryl, I've never killed anybody. I said, your gene is latent, hasn't come out yet. He goes, well, duh, that's stupid. I said, well, duh, it sure is stupid. <laughs> but, it's, but, but, it's, but it's no more stupid for me to say that about you than what you said about me. And he got very, very quiet but I could tell that his wheels were like spinning at 90 miles an hour in his head, thinking about what I said. And then he changed the subject. But within five months, he quit the Klan based on that conversation. So I offered him a different perspective on, on, on what he was thinking. You know, all, all, all black people are, 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 are have, a, have a violent gene because there's so much crime in black neighborhoods, black on black crime. So I said, okay, well, all white people have a serial killer gene. Because most of your serial killers in this country are white, so so I, I I was I was making that analogy, which is bullshit basically, but I was offering him a different perspective, and so he got it. You know, if if I had given him a stack of books this high, written by PhDs, that you know, it, it it wouldn't phase him. But but I I went to I went to where he was and gave him another perspective. Wow. What. I'm not asking this for uh, quantitative purposes. I'm just curious from an impact perspective, what percentage of people that you have a conversation like that with do you think disrobe? I would say maybe 75, 80%. It, it seems so, it almost seems like counterintuitive because yeah. I don't know why there's something about the way that human interactions go. It, it almost feels like, no, 
the way to change somebody's mind is to try to convince them of your perspective, but it's not. It has the reverse effect. Exactly. It's so it's so counterintuitive, and it takes a lot of self restraint. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because we all want it. Want to. you know, inject our reality onto somebody else and you're not going to change their reality. All you can do is hope to offer them another perspective and then they change their reality. Daryl, do you know that, uh, that famous saying around, uh, I, I heard it from Anthony DeMello, a wonderful Jesuit priest. And he said something like, you know, all gospel truth follows the same course of action. First, it's violently rejected then it's mildly opposed, and then it's accepted as gospel truth. So it's like, when we, it's kind of, it feels very similar to what we're talking about. It's like when you try to change somebody's perspective, give them a new reality, even if what you're saying, especially if what you're saying is truth. He's using the example of gospel truth, but you can mm-hmm. insert any religion. Mm-hmm. First, people will violently reject it. Right. Then they will mildly oppose it. Right. Then they will accept it as gospel truth, meaning accept it, uh, accept it wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree with that. Yeah, and and the more and and even if it's not true, the more it's repeated, it becomes the truth. Look at Donald Trump. I mean, he keeps repeating the same lie lie over and over again, and he's got you know seventy four million people convinced it's true. You know, there, there's another saying: um, the the mass the mass promulgation of a lie does not make it the truth any more than the, than the uh, mass disbelief of the truth makes it a lie. Say that again. The mass promulgation of a lie, in other words, the mass promotion of a lie does not make it the truth any more than the mass disbelief of the truth makes it a lie. So just because 50,000 people believe something doesn't make, that doesn't make it true. Right. Have you have you thought about what role karma plays in racism? Uh, yes, and I'll give you an example of karma. And I told this, I told these clan people this. Uh, you saw accidental courtesy, right? Wonderful. Okay. You remember Frank Ancona, the the uh, clan leader, the purple robe. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me tell you about him. He had the largest clan group in the country, and uh, he became you know a very good friend of mine. And I was over at a friend of mine's house uh, just after midnight. This guy was doing some video editing for me on the computer because I don't, I don't know how to do that stuff. And uh, so he was doing it for me. And uh, anyway, my, my cell phone rang and I picked it up and there was this Klansman. He says, Daryl, you know, this is, uh, you know, whoever. I, you know, he, he says, uh, have you heard from Frank? Because, you know, Frank liked me a lot. And, you know, we, we really hit it off. I've been to his home. I knew his wife. I knew his kids. I knew his dog. I mean, you name it. And uh, anyway, Frank, uh, you know, by, by day was a courier. He, he, he would drive parts across the state of Missouri or whatever. And sometimes at nighttime, he'd call me or I'd call him and we'd talk on the phone while he's driving, keep him awake, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, you know, his, his group knew, knew that he liked me and stuff. Some of them didn't like that, but others accepted it or whatever. So this guy calls me after midnight and says, um, you know, have you heard from Frank? And I said, no, I mean, a few days ago. He goes, I think something's happened to him. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, um, he didn't come home. And I said, oh, well, you know, I mean, you know, uh, he says, I talked to Melissa. And uh, Melissa was Frank's wife. He says, I, I talked to Melissa. And, uh, and she sounded kind of funny. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I don't, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. But I, th- I think something's wrong. And I said, well, you know, Frank and Melissa are having problems, which they were. Uh, Melissa is a clanswoman. And um, she... Uh, she had a bad drug habit, you know, crystal meth and all that kind of crazy stuff. And she was stealing clan money and stealing Frank's money and buying drugs and taking things out of the house and pawning them for drugs. She was an addict. All right. So Frank, you know, kept trying to get her help and she didn't want any help and it was causing a problem. So, you know, they were always fighting. And uh, I said, you know, he probably just took off to cool off. He'll probably, you know, be back tomorrow or whatever. And he goes, no, I, I don't know, Daryl. Um, it's just something that just didn't sound right. And he, he says, I'm, I'm going to call Melissa back. I said, okay. And so I said, you know, when you find anything, call me. 
So uh, he hung up and then, um, you know, I finished wrapping up the uh, video stuff and I went on home, went to bed and about four o'clock in the morning, he calls me and um, he goes, Daryl, I said, yeah, what's going on? He, uh, you know, he says, Frank is dead. I said, what? He goes, yeah, he's dead. Melissa killed him. I said, what? And I said, so he told me the whole story. Melissa, Melissa confessed to him that she murdered her husband. And I said, did you call the police? He says, no. I said, why are you calling me? You know, I don't need to know about a murder before the police do. Well, long story short, um, she tells him the whole deal. Uh, she and, and her son, she had a, a son by previous marriage, um, had, had murdered uh, Frank. And they took his body and put it in the trunk of his car. They drove it to the next county over, to the edge of that county, and threw it in the river, threw his body in the river, and, um, and then burned his clothes and left his car there. And then they drove back in, in, in you know, one of their cars. And then what, what she did was she took a shock. She drugged his food that night, his dinner, drugged his dinner, so he passed out. He went, he went to sleep in the bed, and then she took a shotgun and blew his head off oh in the God. bed, okay? And, um, and then, uh, you know, you, you have to wait 48 hours before you, you, know, you report somebody missing, right? So, so then she, um, you know, files a missing person report. You know, well, well, a, a, after they got back home, uh, she and her son went to uh, the dollar store down the street. I've seen that too. And, and they bought new sheets for the bed. And they took the old sheets off and threw them away and covered it, covered it in new, you know, new sheets. And then they went to Lowe's Hardware and bought new ceiling tile because you know, blood splatter had splattered up on the ceiling. And, um, and then two days later, she reports her husband missing. And so the police question her, and uh, she says, you know, that work called him and, and had him come in. He had to drive something over, you know, across the state or whatever, and he hadn't come back. You know, she, she, he left that morning and didn't come back. And, um, well, a few days later, this body rolls back up on the riverbed. And I guess it was some park ranger or somebody, you know, found the body and, of course, reported it. And it was identified as Frank Ancona. And so now things are a little shifty. Um, the, the, the police and the police out there are like, uh, Keystone cops. They're like, you know, you, you remember Barney Fife? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, there used to be a show called, uh, Andy Griffith's show in Mayberry. Oh, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got yeah, it. You know, bumbling cop. Yeah. Well, that's how this police department is. Well, you know, little rural America, you know, you know, they don't have a forensics team and all that kind of right. stuff. So anyway, um, the police go to go to Frank's work and question them. And they said, no, we didn't call him in. So obviously Melissa told a lie. So she didn't want to let them come in the house. So they had to go get a warrant. They get a warrant. They go to the house. Uh, blood has soaked up out of the mattress into the new sheets. And they, and they notice that, that, you know, this ceiling tile is old and that ceiling tile is new. Oh gosh. And so they go and get the luminol, you know, and spray it all over the place. And there's blood all <laughs> over the place showing up in the luminol. And um, so they, they arrest Melissa and her son, and they separate them. And um, Melissa says her son did it, and the son says, no, my mom did it. You know, and so, you know, they, they pit one against the other wow. kind of thing. Uh, long story short, uh, they, you know, they're in prison. They're in prison. And, um, and you know, it would be a long time. I don't think Melissa will ever get out. But uh, I told, you know, I went to Frank's funeral. It was a Klan funeral. And I'm the only one there and with no robe and hood on, right? And uh, I played I played the piano for them. I played some gospel songs or whatever. And uh, they they brought Frank's robe in this glass uh, enclosure. And they're going to make, make, like, make a shrine or whatever. And so I told the second guy in command, who's now in command, he took Frank's place. I said, you know, um, I I would like to have Frank's robe. And he said, um, you know, Frank really liked me a lot, blah, blah, blah. He said, okay. So he took it out of the glass enclosure and he gave it to me. So now I have that purple robe. But um, I, I told him, I said, you know, when you deal in hate, karma, karma will play. And karma will come back and bite you in the ass. You know, 
it wasn't a black person who killed Frank Ancona. It wasn't a Jewish person. It wasn't any of the clan's nemesis. You know, it wasn't a rival clan's person. It was the person closest to him, the person with whom he sleeps every night with in the bed, in the same bed. It was his wife, his clanswoman wife, who murdered him. I said, when you deal with hate, karma will, will cause it to come back and bite you. It may, it may not bite you from the person that you hated on, but somewhere along the line, that hate will come back to you. That's karma. Is there a way to purify that karma so that it doesn't come back? Yeah, get out of it. Stop, stop dealing with negativity. You stop dealing with negativity and you counter negativity with positivity. All right? That's the only way you can do it. Just like Martin Luther King said, you know, you can't drive hate out with hate. Only love can drive out hate. You know, only light can drive out the darkness. You know, I'll give you an example of something. You know, if you're, let, let's say you're, you're, um, you're speeding down the highway. And, um, I mean, you're flying, you know, 75 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour uh, traffic zone. And you're, you're going up this hill. And somebody from uh, in the other lane coming your way is coming over the hill. And that person flashes his, his uh, high beams at you. You know, he's telling you something. You don't know that person in that car. But he's telling you, slow down. You know, something's yeah, yeah, over yeah. the hill. Maybe construction, maybe an accident, maybe the cops working radar, whatever, right? So you slow down and you crest that hill. And right as soon as you crest that hill, there's a cop pointing his radar gun at you. And you're like, whoo, I'm so glad, you know, that guy flashed his lights because you know, he just saved you a $150 ticket. Yes. You know, and points in your license and your insurance goes up and whole nine yards. So you're grateful to somebody you didn't even know who saved your butt that by flashing those lights at you, right? So now as you go on past the cop, you began flashing your lights at all the oncoming traffic to let them know, hey, slow down. There's a cop there, right? You, you know, you're, you're paying it forward, right? So now same scenario. If you come, come flying over that hill and nobody in the oncoming traffic flashed you and you, you cross that hill at 75 miles an hour and there's a cop with his radar, he's like, pull over, you know? I said, you know, you got to pull over. And he says, you know, my name is Trooper so-and-so. I clocked you doing 75 in a 55 zone. I'm missing you this citation, you know, and it's going to cost you $150 and points on your license and blah, blah, blah. This, this man has ruined your entire day. I mean, you ruined it by speeding, but he's giving you the ticket. So now you're all, you're all upset. Your day is ruined. You know, your, your insurance is going to be compromised. Uh, you, 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 you know, you've been separated from your money because, you know, you, you've been issued a fine. And, and now you're mad at everybody who didn't flash your lights at you. So he, he asks you to sign the ticket and gives you your copy and says, have a nice day. And now when you pull off, you don't flash your lights at anybody and warn them. Right. They're like, you know, you're like, damn, you know, I got a ticket. Why should I warn anybody else? You are, you are continuing the negativity. So you counter that by, even though you got the ticket, you flash your lights at other people so they won't get a ticket. Isn't that the hardest time to flash your lights? Yes, it is. But, you, but that's what you got to do in order to avert that karma from coming back. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank so you. happy to be here with Daryl Davis, an incredible blues musician and a man who single-handedly, through positive intention, love, and listening, disrobed hundreds of members of the KKK. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. Let's do it again sometime, my brother. <laughs>